Comenzamos con la segunda charla de hoy. Es un gusto presentar a, a Celeste Damiani, que nos presenta desde el Queen Mary University of London, y su charla se titula Generalizations of Hecke Algebras from Loop Break Groups. Eh, gracias, Celeste. Muchas gracias por, por invitarme. Voy a dar mi charla en inglés, porque así pre preparé la presentación y no me había dado cuenta que todo el mundo habría hablado en español. No, y no también bueno, mi, mi inglés no es tan mejor que mi español, pero quizás en las macro sí. A ver. Eh, voy a hablar de un trabajo conjunto con Paul Martin y Eric Rowell que pusimos en el archive en agosto sobre generalizations of equal algebras from loop break groups. So, before going into the talk, I'm just preparing you that this would be not a very technical talk. I'm more interested in showing you the motivations that led us there and a bit of the big picture in which we want to frame this work. Um, so there may be, uh, I will use some words that might not be very, very familiar to people that are more used to working with uh, knot theory. Um, maybe I've seen a lot of diagrammatical knot theory in these days. So maybe there, these tools are a bit different. Uh, don't be scared if I say something that is not familiar to you. I will give references and just try to um, follow the idea. So I will start by introduce, introducing a concept that stays behind the scene of this work and actually most of my mathematical works, which is the concept of motion groups. Motion groups have been introduced by Dam um, in 1962. He was a student of Fox um, when he was trying to generalize somehow varied groups. And this concept has been uh, developed more by Goldsmith in 1992 in her thesis. So if we take M to, to be an M-dimensional manifold and N an orientable submanifold of in the interior of M, where we don't ask M to be uh, non-empty or connected, whatever, a motion of N in M is a continuous transformation of M, so an ambient of isotopy of M, which brings, um, which moves N inside M and brings it back to the original position. So we can compose motions, we can define an equivalent notion of uh, motions, so we end up having a group st structure and uh, we have the, the group, <clears throat> the motion group of N in M is the group that encodes all the topologically distinct ways of moving N in M so that the, at the end of the motion, N comes back where it started. Formally, this is the fundamental group of the compact support uh, homeomorphisms of M with respect to the uh, relative um, compact support homeomorphisms of N and M and N. So um, wanting to see things in a bit of a more hands-on way, um, we can define, um, we can be more precise in defining a motion as an ambient isotopy Ft of x of uh, n in m such that F0 is, a, is the identity of m and F1 is, brings back n to itself. So F1 of n is m as an oriented manifold. And we say that as motion is stationary if for every t uh, parameter, so for every ft of n, um, this is equal to n. For example, here we have a um, picture of what could be um, stationary motion in R3, where our ambient, our m, is R3. Our n, in this case, is the trifold knot. And the motion is just sliding the trifold onto itself. So it is actually moving, it's not always the same, but uh, globally, N is always um, on, it, on itself. So with stationary motions, we can uh, define um, the equivalence relation. We say that F and F prime are equivalent if the composition of the inverse of one with the other is a stationary motion. And this way we can give an alternative definition of the motion group of M and N in terms of motions up to this um, equivalence relation. 
But if you want to just uh, give, to have the intuitive idea of what we are talking about, keep thinking of the topological distinct ways, the group of topologically distinct ways of moving something into a bigger space. Some examples. So what happens if we take M to be a disk, B2, and N to be a set of N distinct points in the interior of B2? Well, the motions of points into the disk is the um, braid group on N strands, seen in this way. Then um, I think most of you are familiar with the fact that braid groups can be defined in several equivalent ways. And I want you to, to keep this uh, in mind very, very strongly in this moment. Um, for instance, we can define braid groups as the group of certain type of automorphisms of the um, free group of rank N um, as the configuration space of, um, as the P1 of the configuration space of points into R2. And in particular, we can define it as an abstract presented group given by Artin's presentation that we have here, where we have uh, n minus one um, generators, sigma one, sigma n minus one, and they respect the braid relation, uh, sigma i, sigma i plus one, sigma i equal to uh, sigma i plus one, sigma i, sigma i plus one, basically right, the Meister relation written in a braid form. And the other relation that says that when you have crossings on strands that are far, they commute. This um, presentation can also be written in terms of diagram, replacing each generator with a basic diagram, as you can see here at the bottom of the, of the page. And um, writing the relation, these two relations in terms of these diagrams, you get another way to see the braid group as a group of diagrams, purely like that. Um, of course, it is well known that all these uh, definitions are equivalent. So this gives us a good setting to introduce another example of a motion group, which is the loop, loop braid group. Uh, this time we will take as ambient space B3, the ball B3. And um, we will take as N a trivial link with N components in its interior. So the loop break group can be defined as the group of motions of B3 with this link in its interior. And in particular, we ask for orientation to be preserved both on the ball and on the circle in its interior. There can be other definition of motion groups with these objects um, and which differ by if we are asking presentation to be preserved on both or not. Here, we want it to be preserved everywhere. Moreover, surprise, we can define the lumbre group as the group of automorphisms of the free group of rank N that send one generator of the free group Xi to the conjugate of another um, conjugator. So the product Ai minus one, uh, X pi I, Ai, where Pi is a permutation, and AI is just a word in the generators of the free group. This is very similar to the way we define braid groups. There is just one condition less. We are not asking for the product of all the generators to be preserved. And this concept was introduced in 1996 by Anna Sabushkina. Then uh, loop braid groups appeared in the literature also in the form of welded braids and welded diagrams as uh, in Fenn, Riemann, and Rourke, or um, I think originally this was mentioned by Kaufman. But Fenn, Riemann, and Rourke are those that actually um, worked more on this, uh, where they see the loop braid group as the group abstractly presented given by a presentation when we have n minus one sigma uh, generators. And then we have another family of uh, generators, row one, row n minus one. And these all respect a bunch of relations that we will see more in detail later. But just to uh, give an idea, they respect the sigma i generators respect the braid relations. The row i generators respect the relations of the symmetric group. And then we have some mixed relation between the two. Again, we can um, 
write this presentation in terms of well the diagrams where we have like sigma generators represented by the classical uh, crossings and we have these rho i generators presented with this uh, dot i think um yesterday neslian mentioned um virtual diagrams uh, this is kind of um, a relative of those um, then another way that we can see loop break groups uh, is as the fundamental group of the configuration space of n circles that lay on parallel planes in r3 so imagine you have like r3 space and you have a lot of circles that are like all on planes that are parallel to themselves and during um, path in the fundamental group, well, you sort of see them moving um, and they can do two uh, main movement during a path. One is that one circle enters the other circle and come out. And the other one is that just that they exchange position in time. Um, and here you can see the picture of what these two uh, movement would be. Um, I think that Brendan and Archer that wrote a beautiful paper on their structure called the sigma motion the frog hopping, um, which I find quite nice. And finally, there's another way that we can see them, but it's quite logical if we put together the dots of what we've already seen, is that, um, that we can see them as braided annually in our four dimensional space. Just think of the paths in the fundamental group. So at each moment we have some circles in R3 and in a moment later they would be a bit moved and so on. So let's try to see this as a movie. At this point we will have a fourth dimension given by time if we want to thinking like that. Uh, so we're not on our, in R3 anymore, we are in R, R4 and the trajectory drawn by our circles are annually as high um, as one times high. So you don't have to uh, um, remember all of these, just sort of uh, take the, the definition that talks more to you. The important thing is that they are all equivalent and that we know how to pass from one interpretation to the other. We know the generators to, work, to what they correspond, um, and this is particularly um, important, I think. Um, this gives a special interest to loop braid groups with respect to other generalization of the braid groups because they share with braid groups the, this property of multiple definitions that allows us to take a problem in one of these settings, maybe in a group people that study automorphism who thinks they have a problem that concern this kind of group of automorphisms well, we know how to translate it to another formalism, and maybe in the other formalism, there will be more tools to solve their problem. Um, there is a lot of translational research that needs to be done with these groups and um, has not been done yet. Um, even there are, there's a lot of literature in physics. Uh, all my references here, they are all in pure maths because it's what I came across. Um, and these people, sometimes they cite each other, sometimes these people were not aware of the existence of the, this equivalent group in another place, but when they knew, they did. Uh, and then there's a whole parallel literature in physics of people that don't know us and we don't know them, but they are actually working with these groups. So plenty of work to be done here. One thing that can be done is try to um, reproduce the Hecke algebra and not invariant paradigm with the uh, with loop break groups. So what do I mean with this? I will just describe you the dream that we had when when we started the, this work. So take R an integral domain and a unit in R T. To define the Ivahori Hecke algebras, usually, well. If you're a person in representation theory, you might start some, 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 somehow else. If you're a braid person, you start with a braid group. As I mean, we start everything with a braid group after all. 
and you see it as the ring group. You see the, the Hecke algebra, Heimori Hecke algebra, of, as the uh, ring group of the braid group, so RBN, quotiented by a certain um, quadratic relation. Now, here is sigma I square um, equal one minus T sigma I plus T, or some um, deformation of it. So you can see for the way we define that we have a well-defined homomorphism from the braid group to the Vahoriak algebra, sending sigma I generators to sigma hat bar um, generators. And this allows us to represent any element of the Iva Horiake algebra with a linear combination of braid diagrams. And this uh, quadratic relation that is here, we connect, can actually see it as a sort of skin relation. Moreover, we know that the representations of um, the Iva Horiake algebras are equivalent to the representation of BN for which the image of the generators uh, satisfy this um, quadratic relation. Because in the Ivahoriak algebra, see, we have all the braid group relations plus this other one. So why is it so important for knot theory, this object? Well, we all know that knots can be represented as closed braids by Alexander theorem and by Marco theorem um, we know when um, the closure of braids give um, isomorphic knots. So we know how to go back and forth um, between braids and knots. So we can actually use um, algebraic structure of braids to define knot invariant. So an air valued link invariant is equivalent to a function from the tower, um, the disjoint union of all the uh, braid groups that here I denoted with B infinite into R um, that are invariant under Markov moves that are the moves that give you um, equivalent knots starting from braids. These kind of functions, this kind of knot invariants um, are called Markov traces. So of course we think of John's polynomial when we see this kind of construction. Um, but not only, um, other people sort of taking inspiration from it and with more of a um, physics background, um, define supersymmetric invariants. And for this, I will entirely refer to the literature um, of the Gucci, uh, Paul Martin. There's a paper by Kaufman Saler that has all the useful references in this field. Moreover, if we do the, the inverse path, so we start with a knot invariance for, for which we know a skin relation, then we can try to see uh, what's the algebra that we can build uphill. And in this way, uh, Berman Wenzel Murakami algebras have been uh, constructed. Um, if this was not enough, we have invariants, we can go, we can create new invariants. If we have invariants, we can create new algebras. Well, there's also the fact that these have a well understood representation theory. And for this, uh, for braid people, I really recommend Castle and Terrier's book, Braid Groups. Representation theorists will tell you to look at entirely different literature, but I feel that for us, this group is this book is really um, clear. Um, I will refer to that to all the prop about all the properties of Eke algebras that I will mention. If something is not clear and you want to know more, there is everything in there. So we thought, what if instead of the braid group, we plugged in there the loop braid group? It's similar enough. Um, and there are some knotted objects that are related to loop braid groups in a for the knotted surfaces in a four dimensional space that have certain properties and that are called ribbon torus links. Well, does it have any desirable property? 
to know that, um, let's give a look at the most important properties of Hecke algebras. The first one is that it's finite dimensional. In particular, it's a free R module of rank uh, and factorial. If this wasn't like clear enough that it's the thing that we're really interested in, it has a basis, it's finite dimensional, and it has a, uh, has a basis indexed on permutations, which um, is what makes, uh, makes them very uh, good to define not invariance on them. Plus, we have a lot of other uh, properties that are more or less interesting for not theory, but are certainly very important for representation theory. So for instance, when we um, change the parameter and we fix it to one, then what we get is the group algebra of the symmetric group. Um, if the ring that we took has characteristic zero, um, then uh, our Eke algebra will be, uh, again, um, isomorphic to um, R of Sn, the symmetric group. So moving T at most, what happens is that we go back to the, per to the permutations, to the symmetric group. Then if we take R to be a field, let's call it K, then our Ivahori-Eke algebra will be a semi-simple, provided that we don't take certain values of t. It has a very well understood theory over a field of characteristic zero. Um, it has um, a lot of connection with quantum groups, uh, people studying uh, TQFTs that are for interest um, in physics and topological quantum computation and statistical mechanics and with the unboxer equations that we just uh, were just mentioned in the previous talk. But for us, we focus on the very, very first thing. They are finite dimensional. Can we do, can we do at least that? Well, to understand if they are, let's just look at the loop braid group relations. I said earlier that they respect the braid relations and they are written up there on the right. And I think we all recognize them. And then they respect the, the row generators so respect the symmetric group relations. So also with these, I think no great surprise. I think that most of us will be um, familiar with. And then they respect a bunch of mixed relations that say that when two um, row and sigma crossing are far enough, on different strands, then they commute. And then we have these two sort of Reidemeister three relations um, that you can see here. Especially the second one will want you to say, oh, but maybe and then they also respect the symmetric one when you have a ver ver welded crossing going over a strand. Well, no, no, this um, relation is not respected. It seems like an arbitrary choice, but if you see loop break groups as automorphisms and you try just write down the automorphism defined by these relations, you will see that this, this one cannot be, um, cannot hold. So now that we know exactly um, everything that we have here, let's see if it's finite dimensional. Well, we can see, we can write the word sigma i rho i, no relation lets us um, simplify that. You can write sigma i rho i sigma i, sigma i rho i sigma i rho i, and go on like this at infinite. Um, we don't have any relation that allows us to, to, to cut short this word at some point. So no, <laughs> our algebra is not finite dimensional. What we need to do is to kill this kind of words. So how do we do it? We will try to use the representations. For this, we just take a little bit of a panoramic of representation of some representations of the braid group. The most well known, I think, is the Burau representation. Um, and you can see here Burau matrices. Um, it has a strong relation with the Alexander polynomial. It uh, can be used like this combinatorially very easily, but it has a deep homological meaning. Um, and a nice construction looking at the covering of um, the disk with the marked points. 
Then I think another very, very famous one is the uh, Bigelow Kramer Lawrence uh, representation that allowed us to prove that uh, the braid group is linear, because this is a faithful representation. Um, while Burau, we know that is not faithful. Um, it has been proved in by different people at several points for n equal four, I think it's still, um, we still don't know if it is or it's not. It is faithful up to three and then from five on, it's not faithful. Four, still there, but still not useful in general for um, saying if the braid group is linear. And then we have a ton of other relations that come from Tower's quotients of um, uh, ring groups like that one that we took to start uh, our Hecke algebra. So uh, representations of the Havari Hecke algebras. And if we go a step further, we find Temperley Lieb, um, Birma Murakami Venzel relation, uh, algebra relations. And if we want go even further into physics and topological quantum computing, people that are interested in um, sort of different relation, different representations, we know braid group representations that are unitary and that come from braided fusion, braided fusion categories. Um, this is not quite my cup of tea, but if you're interested in, in physics, it's a whole world. So which of these relations extend to the loop braid group? Oh, of course, I didn't mention art in representation for the braid group. It's one of the way that we, uh, we use it as a definition of the braid group. So um, art in representation of the braid group is just braids as automorphisms of the free uh, group of rank N. Well, and we saw the, the, the definitions of the loop braid group. So yes, art in representation extends. Um, then Burau representation, we saw in the previous slide, what is the um, matrix associated to the sigma I relations. And it's quite easy to define another matrix for the row I generators. And we just associate to those generators, the permutation matrices. And we see that they respect all the relations. So Burau extends, and this is a result by version in Anbardakov. Lawrence Crumb and Bigelow, it's more delicate. We don't know if it extends. It doesn't extend combinatorially. If we take the same matrices for the sigma I um, generators and we add the sort of gen permutation like matrices for the row I, then combinatorially it does not extend. We see that we cannot satisfy um, all the relations. However, Lawrence Crumb and Bigelow can be constructed homologically. And um, this um, have not, has not been attempted with loop braid groups, or it has been attempted, but it gets quite involved. So if you feel that you want a bit of a challenge, go for it. Uh, we don't know if it extends for the moment. And then local representations depends case by case if they extend or not. There is a beautiful state of the art of which representations and how they do extend or not in a recent preprint by Bellingeri and Arthur Surie. So now that we have a bit of a panoramic of what happens with the representations of the Lubbray group, let's go uh, back to our construction and see what we can do. So first of all, we will just fix our uh, ring to be uh, C and T to be, uh, and then, because what we are dreaming of are polynomial invariants and we would very much want um, polynomials with the parameter T in C. So our construction becomes the group algebra of LBN um, with respect to this quadratic relation and we can observe that this relation is actually respected by Brown matrices. There is a little game that we can do starting with the Alexander polynomial and writing like its skin um, relation, like the Conway Alexander polynomial skin relation. And we write the relation a bit of times and you will see that we will find this um, quadratic relation or one of its deformation. And 
So remember that we wanted to kill those long words, uh, sigma i rho i, sigma i rho i, so on. Uh, we think, what if we took the extended Borel matrices and see if uh, they um, satisfy some nice relation? More precisely, the extended Borel matrices would be the Borel matrices for the sigma i um, generators and the permutation matrices for the rho i um, relation. And then, without much magic being involved, we just write the, the matrix, um, matrix ri, uh, si, and we see that we can write it as this composition that you see here. Same, you can write the matrix, matrix si, ri, and it will respect this second relation. These are quadratic relations, and they simplify bits of that long word that we wanted to simplify. So let's see what happens if we um, plug these relations into our quotient, and we do this, this quotient, that we will call the loop algebra. Well, the first good news is, the first thing that we were interested is, uh, in is that this loop algebra is finite dimensional. The proof is entirely um, combinatorial. So we see that with all the relations that we have, uh, we can write a bunch of additional relationship relations. And with those, um, we can uh, prove the, um, the result that is written here at the bottom page. So if we take the level uh, n plus one of this loop Hecke algebra, every word in there will be, um, we will be able to rewrite it as the subalgebra of L um, H N plus one generated by all the generators that are um, up to like that are smaller than than N minus one. So the, um, the ones that live in the level uh, below with something in the middle that belongs to the vector subspace spanned by just the generators in the top level and then another word in the lower level. So once we see this, uh, we have that by direct calculation putting into um, a computer program, the, the image of um, and this algebra will be bigger than the image of extended Burau. So we obtain something that is actually bigger than, than, than Burau in this context. Moreover, if we specialize the parameter t, we can see that we can go up by dimension. If we fix it to minus one or to one, it will go up. While in Hecke, at most, we went to the symmetric group. So we have something that is similar finite dimensional and something that is different. Then something that is even more different is that this, um, we, we could prove that this uh, algebra is not semi-simple. Now, semi-simplicity um, let us use simply um, Hecke algebras for invariance. Since it's not semi-simple, probably there's more work to do. However, um, in a 3 plus 1 T TQFT search, um, usually they are more interested in non-semi-simple um, algebras because there are those that don't give um, trivial things. So it seems like looking at it, it seems not a good thing because it's different, could turn out a good result. Moreover, again, if you're interested in um, local representations, we can define a local representation related to extended Burau, you will see in a minute, really, really similar. And we can define another algebra called the loop burau rittenberg algebra because it's sort of an extension of the Rittenberg representation, but also of Burau. So this loop Burau-Rittenberg algebra, the matrices 
that we use that I told you are, that are very, very similar to uh, Burao ones are the ones that you see here. You see that you have the same um, sub-matrix that you have in uh, uh, Burao matrices, but down here you have this minus T instead of having a one. And then for, and this is what you attach to the sigma, um, to the sigma generators. To the row generator, you will attach a specialization of uh, this matrix with T equal uh, one. So you will get, again, almost the same thing that we had in extended Burao permutations with a minus one down there. So they're in any different. And let's consider the um, algebra generated by these matrices. So, well, we could prove mostly um, combinatorially, mostly using um, computer programs to give, give us an idea and then um, proving things, not, um, well, its structure is independent of uh, the parameter t, I think it's an important thing, except when t is equal one. Um, and that, what is with kind of exciting, when we take a parameter t that is not such that t squared is one, and for n up to seven, then this algebra generated by matrices that we can sort of more easily study combinatorially is um, isomorphic to the loop Hecke algebra that we defined previously. And I think my time is almost, yes, I have one minute. And this one minute, I will leave you our conjecture, which is that this might hold uh, for all n. So um, our conjecture is that for t squared different than one, then loop Hecke algebras and loop poor hour Rittenberg algebras are isomorphic. Um, so what next? What's next? One, um, like the reason we started to do this is because with Hecke algebras, you get to John's polynomial and other interesting polynomial um, invariants for knots. So can we use these algebras? Can we study them better? Can we write a basis for them? Um, a basis that is simple enough to be used in computation and find some topological invariance of ribbon torus links in R4. Um, we tried um, just to define a Markov trace on, the, on, the, on our loop Hecke. Uh, algebra and to respect the Markov movement, we found that we could only get, we could only obtain um, trivial um, invariants. But it's also true that we only did this kind of naive test. We didn't try to adapt it to the context uh, or do a tiny bit of more work. Another interesting question starting from here is um, what if we took other motion groups? This construction works for braid groups. We see that it, there's something to say about this construction coming from loop braid groups. It's, um, it's kind of ex exciting that we get something that is bigger than extended Burao, so it's not entirely trivial, but it's not um, something so huge that we cannot say anything about it. So kind of by chance, we have phenomenon really interesting object. What if we started from a um, motion group of a different um, knot for different links um, or um, in the literature, there are some, there's a presentation for um, H trivial links. So motion groups of links where you have some trivial components and some hop components. Then you have the presentation for the necklace break group um, where you have um, components that are um, like linked around a main component. And so we have some presentations and all we used to, to, for our definition was the presentation at the beginning. 
So this could be uh, tried. And then on a more algebraic side, it should be um, interesting to understand if the non semi simplicity of our algebra is a feature or an extra problem. And if it actually breaks our dreams of getting an invariant or not. So I think my time is, yes, it's over and I will stop here. Thank you. Ok, muchas gracias, Celeste. Si hay alguna pregunta. Yes, uh, I have a question. No. <laughs> um, do you know if these uh, Hecke algebras are uh, spaces of uh, algebra of endomorphisms of um, some representation or anything, like in the symmetric case? Um, no, I don't know. Can I ask in Spanish or you prefer English? Can I ask in Spanish or you prefer English? Es igual. Ah. Eh, ¿Tienen alguna conjetura de eh, qué grupo podría parametrizar la base de Rosera? Al, así, haciendo un paralelo con, con el agente. Eh, no, nuestra conjetura, tenemos una una dimensión para nuestra conjetura, porque um, con bueno, un ordenador um, hemos calculado todas las dimensiones hasta 7 y hemos puesto las dimensiones, sabes, en uno de esos programas que te dicen si tienes una secuencia uh -huh. de números, si son algo y parece que tendrían que tener dimensión, tengo que leerlo, por una, un medio multiplicado por el factor da, factora, factorial de 2n sobre n. Así que no tengo una conjetura exacta de qué grupo podría parametrizar eso, pero si lo miras en el internet hay algo con deformaciones de los números de catalán que, que salen por todo mm. lado. Pero no, ten, no tenemos una idea precisa. Perdón, ¿puedes uh, repetir el número que dijiste? ¿Un medio? Un medio por factorial de 2n sobre n. Gracias. Gracias. Eh, Celeste, eh, ¿hay algunas relaciones de marco para las superficies anudadas en R4? Y que, relacion, que lo relacionan con los loop, eh, con los, con los loop eh, breaks? Todavía, todavía no. <ríe> pues, <ríe> um, lo que se sabe es que si consideras uh, loop breaks dentro de un, de un, como de un toro uh, sólido en dimensión 4, como la esfera por uh, S1, pues ahí tienes la conjugación de Markov. Y, y se tendría que probar si tenemos algo como el teorema de Markov por los um, Rimontorus links y uh, loop break groups en el espacio R4 todo. Y eso no sé cómo hacerlo. Sí, entonces en ese sentido todavía hay mucho trabajo, digamos, topológico por, por, por resolver ahí para construir... Sí, invariantes. Hay, así que tenemos una versión, versión parcial del teorema de Markov, pero si alguien quiere intentar tener una, una versión completa, eh, todavía la necesitamos. Muy bueno. Lo que eh, tenemos de bueno es que tenemos un, un teorema de, de Alexander, eso funciona igual. Um, y que siempre y tenemos una, una surjección desde los loop Bay group en estos uh, Rimontorus Link, que se llama um, la Tube Map, eh, la definió Sato en 2000. Uh -huh. y, um, así que ya se puede definir un, un invariante sobre las 30 Lubre Groups y, um, y enviarla sobre, sobre los nudos. Y después se tiene que ver cómo funciona ahí. Una parte del mecanismo ya está. 
Muy bella. Excelente, excelente. Eh, Perdón. Una, una pregunta. ¿Pod sí, sí, ¿Podría sí. dar referencias del teorema parcial? Um, sí. Um, no es muy elegante, pero es mi artículo. <risas> pues um, voy a enviarle aquí el link, al menos la versión de Archive. Pero tengo que dejar de compartirlo en la pantalla. Voy a dejarlo en un minuto. Uh, hello, may I also ask a question? Hello, I, uh, hi Celeste. Uh, uh, sorry, English for me. But uh, so in uh, the conjecture in your previous slide about the two, your algebra being isomorphic uh, to uh, the loop zero Rittenberg. So how, what's the state, how close or how far you are? Are there many, are there much, is there much evidence that they, Uh, will be isomorphic? Is it, are there many difficulties in proving this or? Uh... So, the only evidence that we have is that um, combinatorially we uh, computed what happens in the first cases. And since we have generators and relations, it's easy to put them into a, a computer program and um, ask what are the dimensions of their irreducible representations, um, what's the radical. And so that's purely combinatorially that we saw that up to seven, they are the same. Um, okay, what so you have is a theoretical reason to say they are actually the same and now we will prove it in general. So that we, we for the moment, we are a bit of a like, Mm, But up for up for n equals n equals seven, you have it. So you know that up for n equals seven, it's true. Yes. Ah, okay. So you have it. Okay. Great. Thanks. Mm. Otra pregunta, perdón. Este, en, en el caso en el que m no sea eh, un disco, sino sea un toro, y n también sea un conjunto definido de puntos. El, el loop bright eh, tiene que ver más, sí tiene que ver más con el grupo de trenzas clásico. Lo digo porque si, si tú tomas este, un toro menos unos conjuntos finitos de puntos, cruza un intervalo y pegas, esas tres variedades suelen ser también eh, complementos en ese tres de nudos clásicos. Entonces, hay alguna, uh, en ese caso, hay, es, es más cercana a la teoría del loop bright uh, al grupo de trenzas clásico. No o es si más es... o menos el mismo pro, los mismos problemas. No, nunca estudié este um, grupo en particular, pero no sé, los loop break groups en general están muy cercanos de los break group. Todo tipo de definición que puedes dar por los break group, puedes darla casi de la manera obvia por los loop break group. Tienes un poquito que ajustar, tienes más complejidad topológica, pero, no sé, entre todas las generalizaciones que tenemos en la literatura, los virtuales y um, la, todos estos, todos le falta alguna interpretación que tenemos por las trenzas y no tenemos por, por ahí. Mientras que los loop by groups tienen, lo tienen todo. Um, así que no... O sea, esto de... Las dos diferencias que, que veo por ahora son que no sabemos cómo hacer, no sabemos si funciona Lorenz Kramer Bigelow y esto, que la, que la, que el álgebra que obtenemos de, de forma tan naive um, no es muy simple. Tampoco no sabemos si es porque porque lo definimos así, porque se podrían poner otras relaciones. Es una, una elección muy arbitra arbitraria que, que hicimos de, de, de cocentar así y, y nos funcionó, pero es lo mejor que podemos hacer. No. Oh, ok, muchas gracias. Bien. ¿Alguna otra pregunta? Una pregunta... Eh... 
en, de este espacio de configuraciones de, de circulitos. Ese, ese entiendo que no es un CAPI 1, no es, de, no es un espacio de Allen Bramatlein. ¿Se sabe sí. ya si hay algún espacio CAPI 1 asociado a los loop break groups? Eh, no que yo sepa. El resultado que dices es de, de Brendan y Hatcher y creo que es todo lo que se sabe al respecto. Muy bien. Que yo sepa. Bien, gracias. Sí, ya, perdón, la última pregunta, lo, lo prometo. <risa> <risa> Esto que comentas de, o sea, al final de cuentas es como, bueno, lo que comentabas de que eh, decidieron concientar así porque al final eh, construyeron la representación de Burao, ¿no? Pudieron extender la representación de Burao a partir de la representación de Burao. Me imagino obtuvieron las relaciones y pues las relaciones obvias que, te, que, que cumplía esta representación, de alguna sí. manera las pasaron a la, a la álgebra, ¿no? De alguna manera, me, me imagino que ese fue el, proced, el proceso o... Bueno. o o, ¿O cómo se inspiraron tus relaciones? Que... No, de, 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 de verificar las relaciones ya lo hicieron Bershinin y Bardakov cuando vieron que Burau se extiende. Eh, todo lo que hicimos fue de buscar qué más relaciones eh, eh, verifican los, las matrices de Burau extendidas. Y tampoco fue un estudio tan, tan completo, no sé decirte cuáles son todas las relaciones que funcionan con estas matrices, solo sabemos que Al las que intentamos funcionan. ¿Podría, podría haber alguna relación que funciona también y quizás define una álgebra um, con no sé. una estructura diferente. Yeah. Esto realmente es el principio, pues nosotros lo vemos como el principio de un trabajo, eh, esperando que otra gente también siga Eso. en otras direcciones, porque las competencias que tenemos, pues, eh, eh, Paul y Eric son más de teoría de representaciones, yo hasta que empecé a trabajar con ellos, pues, no, no mucho. Y, eh, Así que, lo que mi intuición sobre cómo, cómo construir cocientes de ese tipo de álgebra es um, pues, pero esto, todo es subjetivo, pero es un poco limitada. Um, es que me gustaría que otra gente que es más um, familiar con este tipo de objetos pues, intente hacer cosas similares. Y, no sé. Um, de buena, lo que hay es que con estas generaciones tenemos una álgebra que merece la pena estudiar. Muy ser? bello. Está muy bueno. Está muy bueno. No, está, está, está muy padre el trabajo. Felicidades por todo lo que han logrado. Está muy, 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 muy bien. Felicidades. Gracias. Ok. Agradecemos entonces a Celeste por su charla. Muchas gracias. Y bien, nos vemos por, por la tarde. <risa>